So do you ever find yourself fretting and worrying about stuff that takes up way more headspace for you than it should? It's okay, we can all be honest today. Yes, I think that happens for all of us. Let me ask you this, have your worries over the last few years grown? Yeah? Maybe a little? So the other day I was doing some, some reading, and uh, this was from a social researcher named Shanti uh, Feldhan. And, uh, and according to her, the research showed that in, in 2019, the percentage of the adult population that had clinically significant anxiety and depression had taken a dramatic jump up to 11%. 11% of adults dealt with clinically diagnosable anxiety and depression. You ready for it? In 2021, that same survey was given. Any guesses what we're talking? 41% of adults were dealing with clinically diagnosable anxiety and depression. And I would not be surprised if a year after that, because now we're in 2022, that was in January of 2021, I would not be surprised if that number has climbed yet again. And it could be, and I'm just speculating, could be that 50% of adults are dealing with a significant level of anxiety and depression. Now, I don't have the statistics, but I would say kids and teens too, right? So this is a significant thing that is happening in our world today. And, and when I start to make a list of the things that trouble me, that, that, that probably take more headspace than they should, that list is long. And I'm not going to share it with you today because I don't want to hand you new anxieties. Okay? <laughs> I don't want to teach you to be anxious over the things that I'm anxious about. But I will say this. Despite all the things that bother me, I, I really work hard to keep a calm demeanor. Right? I, I, want to, I want to come across like everything's fine. Does anyone else find themselves working to do that? Internally, that's not what's happening. Internally, I'm constantly calculating and considering odds, and looking at angles, and preparing for things that likely will never occur. Anybody else? Okay. So, I think what's happened for me is I bought into the idea that preparation can keep people and keep me safe. If I'm prepared, I guess my odds have gone up. That's the way I look at it. Does that make sense? And uh, therefore, I need to know what's going on so that I can be prepared for it. But the more information that I gather, the bigger the problem is and the more I need to know about. And it becomes an endless cycle that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Pretty soon, I'm in that endless loop and needing more information to deal with the last information drive, starts driving me crazy. This is, for me, an honest glimpse behind the mask that I prefer to wear. Just be enough. I like to say I'm ready for anything. In reality, I'm not ready. And I'm freaking out that I'm not ready. Right? So when I heard those statistics that I mentioned earlier, I can admit my anxiety over the last few years has definitely grown, but it took me a little bit to process what's really happening internally and be able to articulate that loop to you. I would guess if you start kind of processing what happens internally for you in anxiety, you could probably get to some place of going, okay, this is what's happening. If you've noticed a rise in your own anxiety, you're definitely not alone. Now, until we stop and assess what's happening inside of us, we will probably find that we're focusing on the wrong things. 
Most of us focus our time and our energy on the very things that make us fret and worry. You ever do that? So here's something I want to encourage you to jot down for yourself later. What you focus on is what you will see. This is an important truth. What you focus on is what you will see. So instead of anxiety and stress, wouldn't we all prefer to have a peace and a joy regardless of our circumstances? I mean, I think most of you, if you have any connection to church and Bible and all that, you're like, yeah, 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 peace that passes understanding. That's good stuff. I don't have it. Right? It sounds great. Yeah, I know we should, but yeah, it's not, not happening for me. Well, thankfully, like everything else, Scripture gives us some pretty good advice. And, and today I want to walk us through at least a good section of Psalm 37. So if you have a Bible or brought a phone or something and you want to pop that up, I'd encourage you to do that. Psalm 37. And uh, Psalm 37 is another Psalm of David. David's a king who knew a thing or two about things that would make a person anxious. After all, he was hunted down like a dog for years by the reigning king of Israel, who just happened to be his father-in-law. So he not only knew what, what it was like to have political persecution, but also familial persecution. He had more than his fair share of enemies and troubles. So this psalm definitely addresses anxiety. But David starts out with what we should be focusing on. If you want that peace and that joy, this is where you need to set your eyes. Psalm 37. We're going to start in verse 4. 37 verse 4. David says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. So our focus should be where? The Lord. If we're delighting in him, if we're seeking him, if he is our desire, what does David say the Lord will give us? The desires of your heart. Yes. So if you desire the Lord, then you will get what you're desiring. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, if that's what you're desiring, if you're desiring the Lord... God's promising you, you're going to get it. You're going to get him. God isn't trying to hide from us. He wants to draw near to you. And when you're desiring him, he will draw near to you. And then he will produce good things in you. Righteous living in light. To the point where you will have nothing to hide. Judgment like the noon day. There's nothing to hide at noon. Good luck hiding anything at noon. Right? And you'll be able to rest in the freedom of not wearing a mask. Not hiding things in your basement or your closet. Be able to rest. Now, that is a picture that is the opposite of anxiety. Right? Anxiety wears you out and wears you down, right? When you get all anxious, how do you feel? Exhausted, right? Maybe sometimes that anxiety can be your motivation to do stuff, but it is not real joyful energy. David lets us know in, at next the dangers of worry, the dangers of that anxiety as verse Seven continues to unfold. He says, do not fret or worry or be anxious. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to what? Evil doing. evildoers will be cut off. 
At the end of the day, most of our anxiety, I think, comes from trying to protect ourselves, often from evil, or people we perceive to be evil, or a threat. We don't want bad things to happen. We don't want to suffer. We don't want bad people to succeed in their evil plan, whether that's a mean neighbor or a power-hungry boss or a backstabbing friend. It doesn't matter who it is. We've deemed them not safe, and now we're trying to protect ourselves. Now, what did that passage say was going to happen to the evildoer? They're going to be cut off. Right? No, it's not good for them. God is going to take care of evil. The people who seem to be winning or coming out ahead because of their evil schemes will not succeed. They might succeed for a moment, but in the end, they will not succeed. What's our job in verse 8? Cease, cease from anger, let go of anger, let go of wrath, let go of fretting or worry or anxiety. Let go of it. It's not the best friend you think it is. So what our job is, is we must delight ourselves in the Lord, not obsess over the threat. Delight ourselves in the Lord not obsess over the threat. The principle that we stated at the very beginning here gets a little bit clearer now, I think. What you focus on is what you will see. What you focus on is what you will see. Are we going to focus on the Lord? Oh, we're going to be, it's going to be good. Are we going to focus on the threat? Oh, then we're going to be filled with worry and wrath and anger. Does that sound good to you? Because it does not sound good to me. This is why I have a love-hate relationship with anxiety. Right? You think it's going to give you some power, and it does not. We've all had this kind of, you know, you focus, what, you, what you focus on is what you see. And I think we've all had these kind of situations where you buy a car, and then suddenly you start noticing that same make and model everywhere. Right? Because you bought it. Right? You bought one or you were shopping for one. And because you're focused on that, suddenly you start to notice it everywhere. Right? So, if we focus on threats and fears and anxieties, what are we going to see everywhere? Threats and fears and anxieties. If we focus on the Lord, what are we going to see everywhere? The Lord at work. That's what you're going to see. And as a result of focusing on the Lord and seeing him at work, what are you going to feel? Peace. Joy. He'll begin to bring about righteousness in you. It's a great thing. So keeping our eyes on the Lord leads to righteousness, leads to joy, leads to peace. When David talks about inheriting the land, he is, in, in the next set of verses here, he's talking about technically the promised land that Israel inherited from the Lord. But the promised land is a metaphor as well. It's a symbolic picture of the new heaven and the new earth in eternity with Christ. So we tend to think that evil must be opposed and that it, it, it will be. It, it will be opposed. But not necessarily by us. Not that we should be for evil. But evil is going to get dealt with. And God is encouraging us to wait on him. Who gets to be, who gets to handle vengeance? It's a common verse. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Right? There's no verse that says vengeance is yours, declares the Lord. I haven't found it yet. I've looked. <laughs> we have to learn to wait on God, to listen for his voice, and not take things into our own hands. Look at how verse 9 ends there. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. 
Yet a little while the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. God's going to provide every need you could ever want. It really does come down, honestly, to pride. You mentioned humility here. Pride allows us to think that we can take control without raining havoc down all around us. Like that we, get, we could just be God for a little bit in our own life, and it's going to be great. It is never great. It is always destructive. We're really bad at being God. Really bad. How much better would we all be if we simply kept our eyes on the Lord? Always looking for him, not worrying about protecting ourselves from everyone else. God will take care of it all. Either the evil person will turn to him and be saved and redeemed and set free, or they will face eternal punishment and isolation. But God is going to fix it all. He's got this. One of the things I found is that when I get all caught up in the what-if scenarios, that my imagination can really run wild. And one of the best ways when you're dealing with kind of a freak-out moment or a panic attack, one of the best ways you can handle that is to do a little math. <laughs> I know that, that doesn't sound right. Like, how does math help with that? Well, obviously we want to keep our eyes on Christ. That's the number one thing. But there is a, a psychological component to re-engaging the logical side of your mind. Right? Your imagination just starts to run away with things. When you re-engage the logical side of your brain, it can calm you down quite a bit. And then it can help you just be able to go, okay, wait, am, am, do I need to be in charge of this? Do no, I need to let God be in charge of this? But doing a little math can actually really help slow down the crazy out of control spiral if, if you start to go down that path. And, uh, and, and so I want to give you a couple of things as we wrap up here. Some anxiety reducing math. These are not actually math equations, but they have math words in them. You'll see what I mean in a second. Just bear with me. I know that, that uh, some people get anxiety over math. This is not actual math. Okay, number one, don't add unnecessary pressure. That's added, right? Sometimes we add to our situation with our imagination. This is a common mistake that we make in, in, in a very busy world, right? We, we keep piling on and adding to with potential stress, potential problems. And how many times have we dreamed up some scenario that the likelihood of that is very, very small? Right? Very, very small. Or, or, like, we're panicking over this could go this way, and there's no chance it will ever go that way. Right? But, but we went there. And because of that, we're dealing with the anxiety of, okay, I just got to get myself ready in case that's how it goes. There's other people that think like this, right? I'm not, I'm not alone. Okay, I'm just, just double checking. So, don't add with unnecessary pressures or fictitious scenarios to build our anxiety. Anxiety is bound to, to set in when we're adding fictitious components to a difficult situation. And then our nerves go up, we start to get angry, we get angry at others, we may even get angry at God. Adding makes us angry. Okay? That's how we end up being the bad guy. We end up painting ourselves into that position. We need God's help instead to keep our eyes on him, to reveal what's important to him, to keep a, a spiritual heavenly perspective and begin to relieve ourselves from thinking that we have to be God. Because we're not. Another problem to avoid if you want to reduce anxiety is this. Don't subtract God's presence from your crisis. Don't, don't act like God's not a part of this equation. 
Right? Sometimes we're like, well, I got myself into this. I'm not going to ask God to get me out of this. What are you thinking? Like, please ask God to get you out of this. God is there at work in that situation. Whether you acknowledge him or not, he is there, and he is going to be working. So if you're worry-prone, don't forget God's presence and sovereignty in the midst of any situation. When we worry and subtract his presence and his timing from our lives, of course it's going to get worse. When we eliminate prayer from our routine, when we don't turn to scripture, when we subtract a divine perspective from our tough times, anxiety is bound to bury us and we'll be overwhelmed. You know, so many times when I'm watching a movie or seeing a TV show, you know, especially something that's a drama or has a lot of, like, hard moments in, in the story, I, I'm always thinking to myself, why are they not praying? Hollywood doesn't have a high priority on it, praying <laughs> in the midst of the situation. <laughs> but I think about it all the time. Like if, you, like, if this was me, I would totally be stopping to pray right now. That's crazy. You're in way over your head. And the Apostle Paul gives us some good instructions that he gave to his congregations in, in, in Philippians. We need to take our worries to God. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Now, how many of you are gentle in moments of anxiety? Nope. I'm ripping heads off if I'm not careful. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Boy, that's a passage worth committing to memory. When we commit our worries to prayer, and praise God in spite of them. We receive in exchange a peace that surpasses comprehension. And that's a good reason to invite God into your worries. As opposed to subtracting him from them. Adversity minus God's presence equals doubts and fears and anger. Every time. A third problem to avoid is as follows. Don't multiply ply your problems. Don't multiply your problems by inserting your own solutions prematurely. We see that all over scripture, right? Somebody gets a, a, an inkling of where God wants them to be, and they jump on it too fast, right? Abraham, like God's going to give me children, but he's not giving me children. I'm going to go do it my way. Not good, Right? Moses is like, God wants to set these people free. I'll do it my way. I'm going to kill an Egyptian slave driver. Not good. Right? There's so many examples like that. Don't get out ahead of God. And when we, when we start to get a sense of where God is moving, that doesn't mean God has said go. Wait on him. Wait on him. When we try to do things our way without seeking God's directions, it's bound to make life more complicated. And when our solutions fail, anxiety then takes hold again. Anxiety will get you if you insist on finding your own way out of the tough stretches in life instead of taking God's path through them. There are times that people will mistake this in you. If you're waiting on the Lord, they will mistake it as laziness. Now, I'm not encouraging laziness. Don't be a procrastinator for the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. Right? Stay focused. Stay obedient. But wait on his leading. If you don't know what God wants you to do, wait. If you don't get the answer right away, keep after it. Don't give up and revert to your own solutions just because you don't see yet where God is at work. Wrestle with him. He wants to engage you on these things. And after doing it your own way and making it worse enough times, that you're going to find that it doesn't work. 
Probably most of us can already testify to that. I've done enough things my own way in my own time that I've started to realize that's not a good play, not a good pattern, and uh, and I really do need to wait on the Lord. Lastly, when it comes to step stopping anxiety, we've had add, we've had subtract, we've had multiply, and, and now with divide. Don't divide life into secular and sacred. What does that mean? Don't try to have part of your life that this is my Christian life and this is part of my life that's not. This is where God's at work and this is where I'm in control. That's a horrible recipe for anxiety and frustration. God never intended us to be people who compartmentalize our lives and have two faces. He wants to be in control of every aspect. He wants to guide you in every way. Selectively trusting God is going to cause us to leave him out of things. And the less we involve God in our everyday lives, the more anxious we will become. There are not parts of our life that God cares about and parts of our life that God doesn't care about. You might go, well, well God wants me to represent him well at work, but he doesn't really care if I get the lawn mowed today. God's in the lawn mowing today with you. He would love to do that with you today, right? God doesn't really care that I'm, you know, 15 cars deep in line for coffee. Well, God will use that moment if you'll give it to him. Absolutely he will. God is at work in every scenario. If we have eyes to look for him, what you're looking for, you're going to see, right? What you're looking for, you're going to see. So as you think about your own anxiety, and your own worries and the things that keep you up at night, that you keep fretting about, that you can't let go of, what are you going to do with those things? How has focusing on them helped you? Really? Has it helped you? If you keep focusing on them, eventually you will keep trying to control things and bad things will come out. Conquering worry is not a matter of just finding a Bible verse or hearing that magical sermon. It's walking it out day by day. Conquering anxiety for most people is a matter of consistently turning your fears over to God. It's not stuffing your fears. When you stuff things, you know what happens? They come out at really inopportune moments. Right? You're like, oh, shoot, I thought I had that put away. And here it is. And it gets ugly. So consistently turn your fears over to God. Pursue Him and seek His perspective. It's the only thing that's going to keep you from letting your anxiety get the better of you and turning you into the very thing you're afraid of. Right? Did you notice in those verses it said, that if we, if we let those fears and anxieties and worries take over, we become the evildoer. We become the very one we're trying to stop or protect ourselves and others from. Let that not be us. Let's cast our cares on him because we know he cares for us. Right? We, take, we walk beside the Lord in every scenario. Because we know his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He wants to walk with us. He wants us to walk with him. So what can you do to lay your worries down and be more focused on Christ than the problem, than the concern, than the fear? What can you do? What is the Lord laying on your heart today? I want to encourage you to think about that and to, to literally take a moment and lay that down. I'm going I'm to kind of close this with some prayer time, but I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. I think we've got one more song here that we're going to finish with. But as, as they come up, why don't you bow your heads and let's, let's pray. Lord God, we do recognize, Lord, that we carry heavy burdens. But they're not burdens that you ever meant for us to carry. They're not necessarily burdens you ever asked for us to carry. 
or do you got this whole world in your hand? It's not our job. What you called us to is to live our lives for you. We sang that earlier. You're, you're the Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for you. God, I pray that we would take those anxieties and those burdens that we're so quick to hang on to or, or stuff down, and instead we would lay them down at the foot of your cross and run to you. Or that you would bring a peace and a joy that maybe has eluded us for a long, long time. Thank you for, Lord, always being there for us, even when we've been really dumb for a long time. You're always there with arms wide open. Thank you that we can run to you. We pray it all in Jesus.